Good evening and thanks so much for joining us again for our midweek reflection. I'm taking a wander these Wednesday evenings through the Beatitudes where Jesus at the start of his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 is outlining what he considers to be the essentials for faithful discipleship. Bearing in mind that faithful discipleship is less about what you're doing for Jesus and more about what Jesus is doing in you and the kind of disciple he's shaping you to be. This evening we have reached the fourth beatitude where Jesus says, Matthew 5 verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. I don't know about you, but if I'm really hungry, I develop an almost desperate craving for food. It's not a particularly nice feeling, nor is thirst. When you're hot and bothered on a sweltering day and your mouth's dry and parched, a cool, refreshing drink of water to quench the thirst is so welcome. Jesus uses these verbs hungering and thirsting to convey that sense of craving, that longing desire for something. You'll do almost anything to get it. That's okay. But then Jesus throws us slightly off track when he says, blessed and happy are those who crave righteousness. Now, if you were to ask most of your friends and neighbors what they long for more than anything else, what's top of their bucket list? Would righteousness be up there? I'm not so sure. I reckon that the old chestnuts of wealth and riches, power and success, beauty and popularity are still the front runner craves that get many people out of bed each morning. More philosophical longings of the heart may include a happy family, good health, job security, just enough in the bank to be comfortable and content, a quiet life. I don't think anyone would quibble with these very genuine longings. But craving righteousness, is it up top as Jesus suggests it should be? Is it even on the radar? Well, what is righteousness? Literally, it means being in a state of perfect rightness. And that immediately begs the next question. Is that even possible? Well, we need to be careful what we're saying here and what we're not saying. And it helps to take things in proper order, beginning with God. God himself, who consists of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, in and of himself, is perfectly and completely righteous. There's no trace of sin, blemish, imperfection at all. He is holy, holy, holy. And within the Godhead, there's perfect relationship, beautiful harmony and spiritual equilibrium between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, God's original creation, Genesis 1, was an extension of his own perfect nature. All that he made was good and very good. Eden equaled paradise. Adam and Eve lived initially without sin, in perfect harmony within the rhythms of paradise. God reigned over a world of righteousness and right relationships until it was marred by Adam and Eve's disobedient rebellion against God's rule. Sin entered and shaped a world of war, destruction, corruption, environmental disaster, a world polluted by relationships of hatred, distrust, revenge, a world overshadowed by death. A world and a people no longer right, very far from perfect. Which is why the world so desperately needed a saviour. One who was perfect. One who had the power to obliterate this global sin problem. 
and who could start to make this world gone wrong right again. We needed God himself to rescue us because we were gone too far to save ourselves. And so he sent Jesus, his only son, his sinless son, into a world so badly out of kilter that it didn't even recognize him for who he was, rejected him and nailed him to a cross. But this was no plan gone wrong. God makes all things right. And the plan all along was that Jesus should suffer death to take the blame and bear the punishment which we deserved. Jesus, the righteous one, died for the unrighteous. Luther talks about God's wondrous exchange where Christ takes our sin and we claim Christ's righteousness. So that if and when we turn to Jesus and trust in what he's done for us on the cross, we, the guilty ones, go free. We're given real hope of perfect life and perfect relationships once again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own, I claim, but holy trust in Jesus' name. So when Jesus says here, blessed are those who crave righteousness, what does that mean personally for each of us? Well, to begin with, we're, we're certainly not perfect yet. We're saved, yes, by Jesus' precious blood, but we're still sinners who sin every day in thought, word, and deed. We struggle daily with sin. We're often tempted and fall foul. We know only too well how far from perfect we are. But if we've accepted Jesus and are trusting in that wondrous exchange on the cross and have claimed his perfect righteousness for ourselves, this effectively covers over our intrinsic sinfulness. Picture for a moment a horrible, ugly, industrial wasteland blighted by heaps of slag, crumbling disused factories, rusting debris littered everywhere, a real blot on the landscape. And one day there's a heavy fall of snow. And suddenly the horrible scene is transformed into a picture of beauty because everywhere looks lovely in the snow. The ugliness is still there underneath. But we're looking at a transformed beautiful snowscape. Our sins are still there, lurking underneath, and well we know it. But with the righteous Jesus now living and reigning within our hearts, we're transformed by his grace, and our sins are covered over, so that when God looks down upon us, he sees not the sin in us, but the beauty of his own righteous son. He has covered over our sins. Though they be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So if we're fully trusting in Jesus' finished work, successfully accomplished on the cross, we're no longer condemned, but accepted and forgiven. We're family. We're children of the living God. As one commentator puts it, he's better at forgiving than we are at sinning. He's more generous than we are foolish. Or as Ralph Erskine writes, it's a great sin to think of any sin as little. But it's a greater sin to think that the righteousness of Christ is not above sin. My greatest sin is pardonable. By his perfect righteousness. I can count his gift of righteousness. As my very own. Forever. Hallelujah. But here's the challenge. Do we hunger. Thirst. Crave. 
righteousness as we follow Jesus in our daily lives so that we may be filled, that is, experience the fullness of his blessing. And you're maybe thinking, well, yes, but how? Five little challenges for you to think about. Firstly, ask yourself, are there other things which I crave to the point that they've become unhealthy obsessions and which need to be deconstructed to allow room for craving righteousness? Secondly, are there specific sins in my life which I particularly struggle with? which are robbing me of my contentment and enjoyment of Jesus, and which I need to intentionally go to war on, take them to Jesus in honest prayer, plead his forgiveness, and then really claim his strength to resist further temptation and to pursue pathways of righteousness. It may also be useful here to confide in another trusted fellow disciple, who can keep you accountable. Thirdly, look to Jesus and ask yourself, what to me is most beautiful and impressive about his righteousness? Perhaps for you it's his humility or his care for the vulnerable, his patience with his disciples' mistakes. And just let that inspire you as you seek to follow and emulate him, however imperfectly. Fourthly, ask yourself, how can I better show forth the beauty of Jesus to the different people I connect with? My work colleagues, my teammates, my neighbours, my classmates, my close friends and family. Do they see the righteous beauty of Jesus in my conversations, my decisions, my actions and reactions. And finally, take a reality check. This is for the long haul. There's a devil constantly prowling and tempting. The battle is real and unrelenting. So we need long-term consistency and commitment to pursuing righteousness and clothing ourselves every single day with the armor of God so that we can resist the devil and follow Jesus well. One day the battle will end for Jesus' faithful followers. Jesus has promised to restore us to his newly rejuvenated perfect world of paradise. All wrongs will be made right. All relationships perfectly balanced and blended again. And we will be filled to overflowing. The hungering, thirsting, craving and longing will end. There'll be rich reward. There'll be plenty. We'll be fully satisfied. We'll lack nothing. All will be well. What a day that will be. This is our glorious future hope in Christ when so much of this world leaves us feeling dissatisfied. Robert Murray McShane's tremendous hymn, When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ in glory, looking back o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know Not till then, how much I owe. And my prayer hero, Scotty Smith, prays like this. Lord, how I long for the day when the entire earth will be as a giant garden of grace, filled with the knowledge of your glory and the beauty of your heart. No more death or dying. No more broken relationships. No more knowing and loving you in part. No more inequality, disparity. No more chronic illness, just perfect wellness. No more funerals, just one big wedding. Hasten the day, Lord. And so I look forward to seeing some of you very soon as you tune in for our Zoom prayer time. 
But please do reflect on these thoughts this evening and take time also to pray for yourself, your own family, for our own church family here at New Mills, and of course, for all the urgent needs related to these crisis days of COVID-19. Thank you so much for tuning in again tonight. We look forward to being with you again on Sunday at 11.30. Meantime, take care, stay safe, and may God bless you. Amen.